First things first, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Sometimes I have useful shit to say and when I do, you're not gonna wanna miss it, so click that subscribe button. Um, secondly, this is my first time using one of these whiteboards in a presentation, so bear with me uh, if it's not quite as smooth of a presentation as you were expecting. I promise I'll get better with this uh, over time. Uh, also, this is a little bit of a longer topic, so I have some notes off here to the side, so if you see me go over here to look at them, uh, that's what I'm doing. So today I want to talk about the most private and confidential trust that I've come across in my career thus far. I call it the Eternum Trust. But before we get into the specifics of the Eternum Trust, let me tell you the story of how I came up with the Eternum Trust. It was actually in response to a challenge from an advisor to a billionaire. And this advisor told me what the billionaire was looking for and told me if I could come up with a solution for him that offered everything that a traditional asset protection trust offers, which is estate planning, flexibility, I'll write this up here. So uh, estate planning, right? Succession planning, asset protection, tax efficiency, plus, write that really big, privacy and confidentiality. So to recap, this billionaire's advisor promised me a meeting with the billionaire. If I could come up with a structure that offered all of the traditional benefits of an asset protection trust, meaning estate planning, planning flexibility, succession planning flexibility, asset protection, tax efficiency, plus privacy and confidentiality. Now, privacy and confidentiality used to be uh, a given when you set up an asset protection trust. And typically, high net worth individuals would go to places like the Cayman Islands or the Cook Islands or any one of the islands uh, that offers asset protection trusts to set up their trusts and they would achieve all of these things, including privacy and confidentiality, but no more. The privacy and confidentiality aspect that these traditional financial centers used to offer are gone. Why are they gone? Well, I'll tell you. It's because these jurisdictions have been bullied by the EU, the OECD, and the non-governmental organizations that they control to implement Beneficial owner registers. Trust registers. And CRS. Now, just to give you a brief explanation of what these is, a beneficial owner register is essentially a, a centralized government register that contains the names of all the beneficial owners of the trust. So that's the settler, meaning the person that set up the trust, the trustee, the protector, and the beneficiaries. And the problem is most of the jurisdictions have either made their, public, their beneficial owner registers public or they've promised to make them public in the coming years. It means that anybody can just go type in a name and see if they're entitled to any benefits under a trust in that country. So that right there pretty much eliminates privacy, right? Then they've also forced them to implement trust registers, which is basically a centralized register of all the trusts formed in that jurisdiction. And finally, CRS, which is an automatic data exchange protocol whereby countries exchange information on bank accounts held by residents of other countries. So for example, Let's say you have a German resident signs on a bank account in the Cayman Islands. 
that bank account information on an annual basis will get sent from the Cayman Islands to the German tax authorities. And, you know, I've actually seen this have some very adverse tax consequences on people doing absolutely nothing wrong. So, for example, you have somebody living in one country, they sign on a bank account in another country, but because that information gets sent back to their home country, their home country initiates an audit simply based on the fact that they sign on a bank account in, in, in the other country. Uh, and that's certainly not right. I mean, I understand having this protocol to try to stop tax evasion, but to just go around auditing people because they sign on a bank account in another country is, is pretty ridiculous. But that's what tax authorities do. So because of these financial centers being bullied into implementing beneficial owner registers, implementing trust registers, and implementing CRS, privacy is gone. Uh, so you can still get estate planning, succession planning, asset protection, and tax efficiency from a lot of these island jurisdictions, but privacy and confidentiality is more or less gone. Now, a lot of, now the EU, the OECD, the Tax Justice Network, all these people advocating for transparency, the main reason that they're giving the public is because they want to stop money laundering and terrorist financing. This is bullshit. What they want to do is they want to know where your wealth is so that they can find a way to take it. And so the way they've done that is they've come up with this huge propaganda campaign to convince the world that privacy is synonymous with shady. The thing is, it's absolutely not. People have a right, in my opinion, to keep their financial affairs private. There's nothing shady about privacy. There are absolutely legitimate reasons, very compelling legitimate reasons, why somebody should want privacy in their financial affairs, including in setting up a trust. And the reasons why privacy is so important when it comes to having a trust. The first one is asset protection. Oh, asset privacy, asset protection. So, I have privacy on the mind. So, privacy is a huge component to asset protection, right? Are you gonna sue somebody if you, if you don't know how much money they have? Probably not. So, it's a huge deterrent if somebody's considering suing somebody, if they don't know how much money that person has, they're less likely to sue that person because they're probably going to think we're going to spend all this money on legal fees and the guy doesn't even have money to pay me. But even if the person that you're planning on suing lives a lifestyle that makes it clear that they have money, you're not going to be able to find their money if that person has privacy. And so that's going to deter a lot of people from suing somebody that they know have money because they're not because they realize that finding their money to be able to collect a judgment is going to be next to impossible. So asset protection is a huge legitimate reason for having privacy. Now, another reason to have privacy is to protect you and your family from extortion and kidnapping. Now, you know, the OECD and the EU and the Tax Justice Network, they'll have you believe that this is not really such a big deal and you don't need to worry about it. Well, that's fine and great if you live where most of the people involved in these organizations live, meaning Western Europe. Uh, then, yes, this is not a huge concern. But what about all the people living in Asia and South America where extortion and kidnapping is a very real threat? Uh, a matter of fact, I have a good friend who was, who, who where there was an attempted kidnapping of, of him because it was out there that he was a very wealthy person. And so extortion and kidnapping is a legitimate concern for a lot of people in you know, less stable places of the world uh, and, and needs to be strongly considered. Secondly, you don't want to be a target of fraud. Wealthy people are constantly the targets of fraud. People try to get them to invest in various investment schemes and things like this. 
think Bernie Madoff. So you don't want that out in the open that you're super wealthy because people might try to target you for fraud. Then this kind of goes back to asset protection, but you don't want potential spouses of either yourself or your heirs necessarily knowing how much money you have because that can make you susceptible to gold diggers, people who aren't marrying you because of love, they're marrying you because of the lifestyle you can provide. And that happens quite a bit that people are targeted, both men and women, I've seen it both ways, that people are targeted by unscrupulous characters for their wealth. So of course, having your wealth be private can help avoid that. Another reason is they want to raise their family in an ordinary fashion. So rather than having their kids grow up in a life of luxury, they want to shield their children for the wealth from their wealth and have the children grow up uh, a more ordinary life uh, and have those values. So you know, there's several wealthy families that I'm aware of that could live in mansions and drive fancy cars and fly on private jets, but they live in rel relatively ordinary houses. Their kids go to public schools. Uh, they fly commercial, uh, and that's how the kids are growing up, and they want the kids to grow up that way. If all of a sudden their wealth is out in the public domain, then you know they're not going to have the ability to raise their children with the values that they want to raise their children with. As a matter of fact, there was a, a, a recent case, I believe it was in the Netherlands or Denmark, where a family had been doing just that for decades, and because of these beneficial owner registers, it came out that they were, in fact, a very wealthy family, they had to take the kids out of the school, away from their friends that they were with. They had to put them in private school. They had to move into a house with huge fence and gates and security guards. And their entire life has, has, has now changed. Um, then, you know, sometimes you don't want heirs to know how much money they stand to inherit, right? Because that can demotivate them. If they know you're going to inherit $100 million someday, well, why am I going to work? I'm just going to wait it out. And so a lot of times, wealthy families want to shield the amount of wealth that heirs are going to inherit from the heirs uh, so that it's a surprise to them when they do eventually get, get something. Oh, last but certainly not least, negotiating business deals. So if you're negotiating a business deal, and let's say you're buying a piece of property. And the seller knows that you're rich because it's out in the public domain that you're this super rich person. Uh, they're less likely to give you a good deal because they know that you can afford to pay whatever you want as much as, 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 much as possible for this. And so keeping your, your wealth concealed um, gives you the ability to go in and negotiate business deals saying, hey, listen, man, this is all I can afford. Uh, which has a lot of advantages. So as you can see, there's a lot of legitimate reasons for keeping your wealth private and, and having your trust be private. Uh, you know, again, these tra the EU and, and OECD and Tax Justice Network, they'll have you believe that, that privacy is shady, but it's certainly not. And the other thing that we have to think about with all this registered wealth, right, is all of this also very much assumes that governments are trustworthy and honest and are going to use this information in a responsible way. But I think we all know that governments have proved time and time again that they can't be trusted, that they don't use information in a responsible way. I mean, just think, for example, if Nazi Germany had a trust register with all the wealth in it. I mean, how easy would have that made the job for the Nazis? I mean, th this is really, really dangerous stuff. And, you know, I've seen governments do a lot of shady stuff in my career. I mean, a lot. I've seen, so I've seen people be targeted by government agencies because there was an agent in there that just didn't like somebody. I've seen the government mistakenly freeze somebody's money. Uh, by mistake, they eventually gave it back, but that didn't help the person why they didn't have their money. I've seen tax authorities target uh, known wealthy taxpayers. In some countries, 
tax authorities and other government re re regulatory bodies will intentionally target wealthy people to try to solicit bribes. And then in a, in a lot of countries, you have a situation where if somebody is accused of wrongdoing, the first thing a government does is freeze their wealth before they've ever even been convicted of a crime or, 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 or that they've proved any wrongdoing. And so, you know, the government should not be trusted with this information because they're not going to implement it fairly. So I think I've proven my case as to why privacy is so imperative. And if you're watching this video, you know why privacy is so important already. So if you want, if you want a trust that has all the benefits of a traditional trust, so estate planning flexibility, succession planning flexibility, asset protection, tax efficiency, plus privacy and confidentiality, the Eternum Trust is the answer. And you're never going to believe where the Eternum Trust is possible. It's the last place you would imagine something like this to exist. It exists in the United States of America, which is a huge financial center with very attractive laws, especially if you're a non-US person. Now, why is this possible in the United States and not anywhere else in the world? Well, because who's going to bully the United States into implementing beneficial owner registers, trust registers, and CRS? The US doesn't get bullied. The US does the bullying. So, you know, the EU, the OECD, the Tax Justice Network, all these people just pick on countries that really can't defend themselves against the economic might of these organizations and the countries that they represent. Uh, but the U.S. is not somebody that can be bullied. So they can make whatever laws they want. So the U.S. does not have, uh, for, does not have beneficial owner registers uh, or trust registers. Trusts are completely private documents. Not even the government knows they exist. It's between you and your lawyer who drafted the trust. There's no way for anybody to find out about this. It's completely private. And there's no CRS because the U.S. is not a signatory to CRS and nobody can force them to do that. So financial accounts held in the U.S. are not going to be exchanged with um, home countries pursuant to CRS. So... The Eternum Trust, as I said, offers ultimate privacy uh, because there are no beneficial owner registers, trust registers, or CRS in the United States. It also offers very flexible estate planning uh, and succession planning due to uh, very strong asset protection trust laws in many United States, uh, which are, are very modern, very comprehensive, and, and comparable uh, if not better than those in some offshore uh, jurisdictions like the Cook Islands, Cayman Islands, you know, these islands that, that are traditional uh, trust planning centers. Uh, and additionally, it's super tax efficient. So if you set up an Eternum Trust and you're not a U.S. person, so it's not a U.S. person who's setting up the trust and transferring assets to it, there's no U.S. tax payable on the Eternum Trust uh, unless there's U.S. income. So if you have a non-U.S. person, sets up an Eternum Trust, no U.S. income, no U.S. tax. There's not even a tax return filing requirement. So this is a completely anonymous, confidential um, trust with no U.S. tax, which is awesome. I mean, you can't beat that, right? I mean, this is better than any financial center that I can think of, like Jersey, Guernsey, Cook Islands, Cayman Islands, all, all these countries. Um, Furthermore, you can have your trust either managed by a professional trustee or by a private trust company that you control. So you can have it either way. You can have it professionally manage it or basically manage it yourself or have it managed by trusted advisors. Uh, additionally, there's some other benefits that the U.S. offers uh, that I think uh, are, are things that a lot of other jurisdictions can't offer these days. One is easy banking. If you try to open a bank account, in a country other than the United States recently. I mean, it sometimes takes months. They want to do the equivalent of a financial colonoscopy. It's a nightmare. In the United States, you can walk in and open a bank account in almost any bank within 15 minutes. It's super easy. Uh, secondly, the setup costs of an Eternum Trust and the ongoing maintenance costs 
are fairly low compared to what you would pay in a traditional financial center uh, that, are, that are used for, for trust planning. Uh, again, there's, there's great asset protection laws, asset protection trust laws in many states. Uh, the PTCs, which are you know, the private trust companies that you can manage yourself, they're not available in all states, but they are uh, available in many. And the U.S. is also generally a whitelisted country, right? If you're doing financial transactions in or out of the United States, it's highly unlikely that another country is going to question money being sent to the U.S. or money being received from the United States. Whereas if you're doing this from one of these financial centers, that might not be the case and you might have to provide uh, a, a lot of substantiating documentation to the, the banks involved to prove that it's a legitimate transaction. Uh, this is all possible because the U.S. has this quirky tax law that allows you to have a U.S. trust that's treated like a foreign trust for U.S. tax purposes. Um, and so it creates this ability where you can have a, a U.S. trust that's governed by the laws of a state, uh, but for tax purposes, <coughs> it's not considered a, a U.S. trust, meaning as long as there's no U.S. income, there's not going to be any U.S. tax unless the trust is set up by a U.S. person. So if I'm an American citizen and, and I transfer money into the, into the, 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 the Eternum Trust, then the U.S. is basically going to disregard um, the trust for tax purposes and I'm going to continue to have to pay tax on the income that the assets that I transfer to the trust generate. But if I'm a non-U.S. person and I transfer my non-U.S. assets, like let's say, for example, a large stock portfolio to the Eternum Trust, uh, there's not going to be any U.S. income tax. There's not going to be um, any U.S. tax and, uh, or sorry, any U.S. tax return filing requirement. And, but if I'm a non-U.S. person and I transfer assets to the Eternum Trust, uh, my foreign assets to the Eternum Trust, there's not going to be any U.S. income tax uh, on the income that those assets generate as long as those aren't U.S.-based assets. So if you're interested in learning more about the Eternum Trust, give us a call. You can email us at info at esquiregroup.com. Uh, also check out our website at www.esquiregroup.com. Look forward to hearing from you uh, and hearing your comments and thoughts on this trust. Again, don't forget to subscribe.